and you can go live. Is that okay? Yeah. So, what are the expenses? Well, let's put it this way: it's about hundred k, a little over hundred k a day. Day. Hello. Hi. Hey, how are you? My name is Jeff. I'm John. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Oh, Chris. Yeah. Oh, Chris. Okay. Steve. Steve. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Nice you in the military you. still? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Look like a military guy. <laughs> I just like the haircut. It's easy. Where is everybody? Everybody that's oh. important is here. <laughs> You're right. It usually takes about 10 minutes. Right. Everybody is fashionably late. <laughs> Oh, hey, Chris. I'm sorry. I forgot. I need to send you uh, an invite link so you can hop on and oh, yeah. I'm send it to your Skype. Make sure to open it in uh, Google um, Chrome, please. <clears throat> New screen or new projector or both? New screen. Nice. Do, 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 do. Okay, communication. So let's go ahead and do that. Test, test one, two. Yeah, just the top on, on top. There's a button. Sweet. The audio is going straight to you. See, did you set up the audio so it's, uh, it's like PNP? Oh, no. Oh. Okay. Well, it's on mute. It matter. How's it picking up the lapel? How is it picking up the lapel? Oh! <laughs> it will make for a little bit better online viewing. <laughs> okay, let's All right, so welcome. I, I think we're gonna have a couple more people trickle in, but um, I will be happy. 
if we get like the, the usual late people that come out, I'll, I'll re-announce this later. But we will not be having our meetup here um, next month. They need this room for merchandising for the Christmas season. Uh, so just keep in mind, uh, if you're not on the, the email list, uh, did, you, did you guys get my email? Do you, okay, so if you don't, if you, if, I'll use the same, that's what I use actually use to notify the group. But um, it looks, it like, looks we, like we probably will be up by the Walmart that's on Copper Hill. There's the industrial area behind that, um, Constellation, Hercules, and... Rye Canyon Loop, I guess, in that area. So um, there's a room that's up there that potentially we can use. She's already offered it to us. We just, I didn't know about it today. So I haven't confirmed. So we're going to be um, able to get a room that's up there for next next time. Can we eat in there? Yeah, I think so. So I'm thinking um, I might make it a pizza party, you know. So uh, donations of 2 to $3. Eat while you want. Um, that should cover some of the cost of that stuff, but the rest of it, uh, I'll cover the rest of that on that way. Is the room? Is there going to be a charge for the room? You know. I don't, I don't think so. Okay, so we'll find out more about that too as well. But even if you don't come and eat, I mean, it's, I'm just gonna. It's a donation if if you want to help out with the pizza price. If not, then just come and eat anyway. Uh, it's the end of the year, and I really appreciate everybody that comes out and contributes to what they do for everybody. So. Um, I'm going to be talking, I know I, I mentioned some about this book last time, but I re-went back through the book and took a bunch of notes or as much as I can. I listen more to the audio because I drive when I do most of it. So what, that and then when I'm walking. So I'm taking notes usually on my Evernote. So um, uh, I have a just some super fascinating stuff that that book covers. Uh, I highly recommend anybody who's interested in getting to understand human psychology, whether it regards influencing them for marketing, how people think, just in general getting, he even talks about how small little things can actually affect happiness in life. And it's really uh, a whole bunch of foundations of to human psychology and human nature. So it's, um, I'm gonna be covering quite a bit of that today. I want to bring up my Evernote so that we can follow the notes on here. And these are literally just notes. So oh, I have it on the bottom here. I think it has to just give it a second for it to sync up, and we'll be able to get that. <laughs> Uh, I can, but usually I'm because I'm listening a lot of a lot of it to audio. Like I actually have a hard copy that I brought, and that hard copy what I was doing is actually taking notes in the book, and I was gonna I was gonna do that, um, but then I found out I just don't have time to sit down with the book, and so when I started re-listening to it, and I realized, like in the middle of something that's really interesting, that I'll just jump open my Evernote on my phone, and take notes in it, and it'll start to just update through here. So that's typically what I do, um, and it's very Ah, the mo the the most common way I use it is when I come across websites and information that I have uh, I I need to remember and that I don't ever want to have to look up again, um, and I'll actually use it like a bookmark. I'll take the URL, throw it in there. I'll actually sometimes copy and paste the page right into it because then it actually just sa saves some of the referencing going through there. Um, but I don't know why it's not bringing up my most recent notes. Oh, here it is. And the good thing is that then it goes on to everything. Yeah. You know. So I'm going to be going through a lot of this stuff here, um, but that's going to be later on, I guess, uh, we get maybe a one or two more people to come that's going to be coming in. But before I start, is this your first time here? Yes. Uh, everybody else has been here at least once before, right? Okay. So just to let you know how it works is it's pretty casual. Um, usually we do have more people that come out for the, the meetups. But 
you can leave it any time. I mean, you don't have to worry, but it's really an open discussion. That's what we really wanted to do to make sure we keep it that way. My goal for every meeting is that if somebody has questions, anything regarding internet marketing that they ask. We have marketers here that are brilliant, that have a lot of different experiences and different, it's kind of like um, almost type any type of money-making niche, like even real estate. There's people who really understand flipping, there's people who understand mortgage notes, there's people who understand rentals, people who understand how to buy and sell, and just everything else that's about that part. There's people who have specialties that they like certain areas of it. Well, internet marketing is even more vast. Selling physical product online, selling digital products online, um, selling internet advertising space, there's YouTube, there's, uh, I mean, eBay, Amazon, anything you can think of that's actually going online today, you can pretty much make money on it somehow, some way. And that's why it's pretty diverse on what we can go over and the different things that are out there. So if you have a business or you're into doing something and you have any questions that's going on, ask it. If we don't know the answer, hopefully by next month we'll get it for you. Um, but it, usually people here can give you at least some ideas behind stuff that's out there. Um, so that's pretty much the essence of the group. Usually there's going to be a subject. If there's something you want to learn about, um, we did what, Pinterest a couple of weeks, months ago, and then we have also done YouTube in the past. We've done other small things here and there uh, for different subject matters that are going on. Has anybody here, and were you in the, any of the YouTube contests that we had in the past? You were, have you looked at any of your videos in the past on, on how they've been doing? OK. So. I asked Steve about this and kind of want to get your ideas. I, of course, this group is kind of small, but I am thinking that we might have another contest come up. On the, it's going to be on YouTube again. Yeah, and yeah, it was. And the thing is, what I did was I went back, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, looked at the channel that I had put up this YouTube videos. Now, we had a YouTube challenge, and what that was was anybody who wanted to enter, you could just enter. And the rules are you had to put one YouTube video up a day. Okay, so one of the contests was you had to put one YouTube video up a day. It could be anything, six seconds, 10 seconds. It was about getting people in the habit of getting stuff up there and taking action of doing something. The idea was hopefully that somebody would get encouraged and do something more and keep on going and get something bigger. Um, and at the end of 30 days, if somebody, if all the people who actually finished qualifying by doing one per day and getting something up, you're entered in a drawing to win an iPad mini. And then we also had gift cards and had a lot of contests, I mean, stuff in that one. And then we had another one where you had to, another YouTube contest was 30 days again, but you had to do a how-to video. It didn't matter what, whatever subject matter you had, because how-to videos are no, 50% of YouTube searches are, are on how-to, how to do something. So we did a how-to contest, and that one did actually pretty good as well. Um, that one we gave away quite, I think that one gave, we had two iPad minis in that one. Yeah, the other, one we had a Nook um, that we had entered, and my sister had won that one. So anyway, I went back to the how-to contest videos, and I realized the channel that I had up there had over 10,000 views from those videos that were made, which qualified the channel to then start becoming a revenue-generating advertising platform. So how YouTube works now is before you could just start throwing up videos and you could monetize it. Just turn on a little switch. As long as it wasn't copyrighted material, you didn't break any other rules, then they would ads start popping up and you would make money on it. Well, I don't know, maybe about four months ago, Amazon changed, I mean, YouTube changed the rules. And what they did was they made it so that you cannot monetize your channels until you have at least 10,000 views. Um, and the cool thing is that now, as time has gone on, not only can you have multiple channels that are making money, but you can combine them under one, pretty much one login. So I've been able to do that where all of my YouTube channels that I've had are now under one. Now, each channel has to have 10,000 before it can monetize. But it's pretty cool that some of them have actually begun to monetize. And it's kind of really simple stuff. The one, the one that's actually getting a lot more views now is the video is how to um, how to how to capitalize everything in Microsoft Word uh, in shortcuts and it's very it's just like one minute videos and those type of things that come up on there so
Uh, for that particular channel, yes, that was it. So actually, on the left-hand side here, these are people who were in the contest. Um, a lot of them were, were are from here that did it. So I don't know if I think are your are your are your videos still up? And I, did, I privatized I privatized some of mine too. It wasn't worth keeping up, but it was part of the fun to do. So. Um, do you, can I, can I, can we look at your channel? What is your channel name? Ah, so let me subscribe to that. Seventeen hundred views. So, is this yours? Yeah, so we have, I mean, you got, there's so many opportunities for stuff that's out there with YouTube. So I was telling Steve, would, would, did he think that people would actually enter if we did a 100-day contest? Because I honestly believe you put 100 videos up with and with a little bit of thought effort on what you can do it and then after it's done let it sit for a year or two some of them might really surprise you um we currently have video i currently have a video up that does a, i think it's like a couple thousand views uh per week that does it um and it's up to about three hundred sixty thousand total views on that one so and that's another thing that actually started really getting me thinking well if I focus a little more, because I have a whole bunch of how-to, um, even shortcuts on Excel, and I know those do well as well. And I looked at my sister's channel, and she actually had a couple of videos that had like seven or 8,000 views as well. And she was doing some Excel shortcuts and tips on that. So we could go through how to make videos get found on YouTube, some of the more simple con concepts and ideas behind it. And if you entered it in 100 days straight, we would then give away either iPads again or something that's actually a value that people might want to do it. But it would be a drawing. And I was telling them that what we could do is that we could actually have two big prizes. One, as a raffle drawing for everybody who qualifies by doing 100 videos in 100 days. And then the other one would be for that whoever's channel gets the most views maybe 30 days after the 100 video challenge of those 100 videos. Then the next month that we have our meetup, let's see who got the most viewed. So there would be some effort and thought that would have to be done. Now, there's days that you're going to be scrambling to put up a video. And in those days, then you just put something up. But there's other days that you're going to have time to really think about what are people looking for, what do you have to offer, and what can you share. And it can be really simple tips like even grabbing content from this persuasion book or even the big leap or even talking about certain things out there because people are looking for reviews all the time on anything but they're also looking for advantages of different things so there's ways to find out what people are looking for and how they're going after things so we're thinking about i was thinking maybe we could do it he's he thinks 100 days is too long but to create a habit <laughs> 30 days wasn't enough for most of us so 60 days? Maybe that's not a bad idea. 60 days would be good. Yeah. And what gave me the 100 days is because there's a website up there that this lady or guy, I can't, somebody's running this. It's 100 days of doing something. And they created this website. And all you do is you sign up and you tell everybody in the world that you're committing to do 100 days of something. And everybody else who wants to do get better at something, they all join on the site and they encourage each other. It's a whole social media type 
um, platform idea behind it. So you have people that say, okay, for the next 100 days, I'm going to practice the ukulele for 20 minutes. And you can see people get phenomenally better by the time they start to the end. And there's a whole video record because every day they go on that, they play for 20 minutes while they're on it. And they film this, and it's accountability. And of course, people, like I said, are cheering you on to do this kind of stuff. But they say it changes people's lives uh, for the better. Well, people that are actually on that 100 day site, they actually are. But for the YouTube, it can be anything. I mean, the challenge is 100 videos of something that you, you, what, your, what your goal is to do is to get people to watch it. So you can do whatever video you want. You won't probably want to put stuff up with some decent content on it. Um, that way, at least, when it goes up there, if people start to gravitate to it, it'll start to do it. Now, the, the idea is also, even if you don't win the contest, your videos are going to be up there and they start working for you. Once you hit that 10,000 view mark in your channel, then you can actually then turn on monetization and you start making money. So those videos, I was telling Steve, it's not a big deal, but the how-to challenge is now going to be able to make enough to buy me my cup of coffee once a month when I come here. It's like three, three or four bucks. Because uh, I mean, it's pretty interesting. So my wife was like, those are like one-minute videos. Just make some more shortcuts. So I do. I have a, I, got, I had a whole list of shortcuts. In fact, I just went word shortcuts. And then I can I set up my webcam so it's now facing right on my keyboard. And then I have a Camtasia, which can do both. It can do a screen capture and the webcam at the same time. So I can show people how to highlight all the text, hit Control, Alt, and whatever. And then it changes every first letter of the instantly the capital letters. Of the, yeah, so it's, it's, it's all these stuff that's built into to Microsoft Word. And Excel has all these shortcuts as well. So she's like, just throw one up a day. And I said, you know what? <laughs> Let's make a challenge so that way I'm super motivated to get one up a day no matter what. Uh, and she thought it was a great idea because she entered the challenge last time too and she got disqualified I think within a week um, because she didn't she was any, unable to con consistently do it. But um, it's something planned for next year that we want to do it because like I said this group is all about trying to get people to also progress in their internet marketing uh, as well. Um, does any one more announcement for uh, Vitalik? He oh yeah. Uh, what was it called? Loading, loading, loading. Uh, this year's startup weekend at COC on November 17th to the 19th. Have you guys heard of that at all? Um, I'm not sure if you guys are interested, but he, he wanted to see if we can just talk about it real quick. Um, so I guess uh, at COC they have kind of a, a startup. It's almost like different teams get together and they just build their own startup company over the weekend. There's um, there's a lot of different. It's not just Teams. It's also just people just watching them, see how they work. There's also, um, uh, I guess, like sponsors and potential investors and things like that. Uh, so if you guys want to go, it sits from the 17th to the 19th at COC. Um, COC, College of the Canyons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, November. So this, the, the 17th to the 19th. Uh, our judging panel consists of a guy who started Scorpion Internet Marketing, the guy who founded uh, Infinity Ward, and a couple other notables, cash prizes, web design, and three months co-working space prizes included. So if that interests you guys, if you want to compete or, or whatever, COC. What is the date on that? 17th to the 19th. I'm not sure. He didn't give me all that information. He just said to mention it. Uh, but if you want more information, just let me know and I, I'll, I'll get it to you. Okay. I'm trying to find. Sorry, there is a. an event that's coming up in Vegas, and I believe Anthony Frank, who's a, a former member, member of this group, a friend of mine is, oh yeah, so this is it. So there is a boot camp that's going to be put on uh, in Vegas. So here, uh, if you follow my shadow on this section here, January 9th, 17th to the 19th. Um, oh. Yeah, that. So, so basically, he's, he's 
I asked them for um, like a one sentence copy of explaining what this is. I, when I saw the dates, I told him I couldn't make it. So he actually sent me kind of like a, a pitch. So he said, the event can help you get customers fast by learning secrets, five figures on Facebook in less than 30 days without buying ads. So there's all of these people that he's gotten together um, that are authorities in their market. And if you're interested in actually getting more information on it, it is, I asked him to send me a link and he sent me an affiliate link and I don't have time to sign up for it. I just noticed it now. But, um, is there? what is that? You put it on the page once. Like okay. Authoritymakerbootcamp.com. So that's what it's going to be. <laughs> I am going to try to make it to this event, but it is in the middle of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So I told him that is going to be a little problem for me because I don't know if I can take off of work to go do, do it. But it's January 17th to the 19th. Are you going to go? Anthony is a fantastic networker, so he gets to really meet a lot of different people out there that are really big in um, their fields of what they do. Um, can you go over this with me? What it, what it is? I didn't actually since I didn't have. Yes. X O O M, like the payment for like international, like. Am I thinking of the right one? Oh, oh, I'm thinking of a different one. Yes, I've used Zoom before. <laughs> it's like Skype, right? Yeah. But okay. Yeah. He showed me. John showed me. Well, I like I'm talking about and meeting on Zoom because she's in another state. So I just started doing that. I'm like, this is cool because you can have a meeting with somebody. It's like, well, you can't on Skype. No, I realized that. I don't know why. It seems to work better. It works really good. I thought it was really good. I personally. I've always been on the other end of Zoom where people have set up stuff and I've gotten onto it, and it's been super easy. When I set up a meeting, since I don't use Zoom as the user side of it, I usually tell people to get on Skype. And I've found that there are a lot of people who don't know how to use Skype or don't use Skype. And I mean, a lot of, uh, thankfully, when we were running our business, most of our business associates that we were contacted through all use Skype. Um, so it looks like maybe a lot of business oriented entrepreneurs will use it for a lot of different things. But um, in, I guess, the bigger corporate world where I use it now, where I'm, like I said, the recipient, they, they, a lot of them will use Zoom because it just seems easier. Yeah, it's very easier, user friendly, where you don't have to sign up for anything. You just click a button from your email and it launches. So like go to meeting kind of runs. I wonder. I mean, it's been a while that they've owned it. And like I said, I'm still a Skype user. And the payment systems are not integrated one uh, with together. And Skype is a nightmare. Even on this system, I have two Skype apps, and I don't know why there has to be two. I, one is an upgrade, and that upgrade doesn't work. And the old one is where I have to go to get even stuff that's on there. They, being as powerful and as smart as Microsoft people are, they are not good about making things user friendly. It's like made for engineers and things like so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, the best they can do 
investors who are there who are there to discover mm -hmm. um, there's some schools that's not the first time that they're purchasing free. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to get better because I use it. I like it. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody else is using it a lot easier. Um, it still seems to be not, there's no, there's no like one standard norm. You know, it used to be so easy when Yahoo, Mess Yahoo and Messenger were all what everybody was using for instant messaging, and then they started doing video. They just integrated video would have been a lot easier, but instead, they bought Skype, and it seemed more complicated. I don't see any problem with that. What is that? What is that? That's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. We'll see how that goes. I mean, once if somebody can put together a platform that's all encompassing in one, I thought Facebook might be a way to go on that way. The thing about Skype is that I've been hacked, and somebody hacked my Skype account and contacted all of my people on my, my contact list by sending out an email with a link that actually then would enable the hacker to get onto their Skype accounts. It's like a virus that's through Skype, and I don't I have no idea how they got into that. So I now use you know, double verification, but even for them to have gotten into my Skype, it was a pretty uh, higher-end encrypted um, type password. It wasn't an easy one for them to go into. So I, uh, unfortunately, some people actually clicked on it, and then they told me, hey, you got hacked because they got whatever virus or uh, opening from it too. Um, so if you, anyway, if you want to go to the Vegas thing, the authority maker boot camp, um, pretty affordable at 197. Uh, and, you know, in Vegas is drivable. Uh, like I said, I'm going to see if I can try to make it out there. One, for supporting Anthony, but like I said, the guy networks with a lot of great people. So it'll be interesting to see what he has out there. Um, so before I go any further, does anybody have any questions that they brought before I go into my subject matter that they wanted to ask tonight about finding out more information about something that? Somebody in the group can provide information on. Anybody? Hmm? Okay, so because I have it in my Evernote, I'm going to go over the pre, the persuasion book. Now, I also I did a big push on this book last week, so that was my plan to do it. And Barnes and Nobles did not have the books come in, so I know some of the people that I had asked for. Yeah. Are, um, this is another thing too, is when we have those contests, because I've actually committed to telling them, I'm gonna, in the end of the contest, if we have some of the, those who participate, I'll probably buy a handful of these books and give it out as also additional raffle prizes if we ever have that contest going on there. But that won't probably be till next year. So I would recommend anyway, I still believe bit, huge. This book can be a game changer for anybody who's going into the internet marketing or business world to understand, um, the potential that's really out there called the it's called the big leap for those of you who weren't here last week i highly recommend um looking into this book because the way that it makes you really rethink about getting into your passion it's a fantastic book on that part but what i really want to do is go into this book this week called persuasion and it's because it has so many great ideas and concepts when it comes to marketing and how to do even better marketing. I'm a big fan of what's called conversion rate CRO, conversion rate optimization, which means doing something as small as possible on your website that can influence someone to do, take action to maybe purchase your product or whatever your idea is, if it's for donations, if you're a nonprofit, or if you're just trying to get a message out and you want your message to be more apt to be grasped by your audience, there's so many things that can be done because the human mind is, just a fascinating tool or um, powerful, I guess it's an organ, right? <laughs> but um, so I'm going to really go over it. I hadn't planned on how I was going to present this. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. So I've been going through it on audio because I my commute um, I just keep listening to it over and over because there's so much good information I forget I've gone through it like this is a second round going through now and almost ready to go back through it again and um, it, it's mind blowing how much things I, I forget when I've gone through but yeah it's a uh, there's the audio version 
I get it from audible.com. Oh. Yeah. Um, but you. I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't know how to do that. But. I think all you need is this password, and then you can be on. It would be like if you were listening to Audible on your cell phone or another device. The only problem is if somebody's listening to the same book as me, it'll when he's like if he's on chapter one and he gets and he stops. When I go back onto mine, I'm going to lose my space because they won't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So that, but there's um there's also there's a couple of different audio audiobook sites. So I would recommend unless you want to put everything on one, you can. But there's also audiobooks.com. That's another site. Yeah. I compared prices and they're not the same. Sometimes you can get one cheaper than the other. They both have like fourteen ninety nine monthly subscriptions, which will give you one book per month. So what I used to do is be on audible audible.com and then I'd look for the most expensive book and wait till my month comes up and then get that. And then uh, every once in a while they'll have specials where you can get like three books for like twenty something bucks. Yeah, they have some deals and stuff that come around on that. So it's kind of it's. Oh, so then I found the library. So I've canceled my Audible.com, but the thing is, the Santa Clarita Library has a very limited selection, especially when it comes to business books. You know, what? I the, I don't. Yeah. But there's also something called Overdrive, and that yes. Sometimes you have to wait. You know, yeah, yeah, so they have a limited amount of licenses, so you have to wait on that, which is not bad too. But then you only have two weeks to listen to it. And I like to, like I said, go back to books that I've had on there. So every once in a while, if I found a really good book, I'll resubscribe for fourteen ninety nine, buy a book, and then if there's like two or three in line, then I'll just wait for a couple months. But I'll, I'll start putting them on there. But it's pretty good. Um, Barnes and Nobles also has their own system, so you can also get books from them, and it's I think pretty comparable from what I've heard on that one there. Um, let's see. Is it? What is that? You can share on mobile. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Legally. Legally. <laughs> <laughs> but, does it, but does it have to be to another Audible um, subscriber? I'm guessing. But you know, but you, know you can also update your subscription with Super. Really? Oh. Yeah, I've got a lot of books to go back through again over and over. I see, but the library is pretty decent on that too. I got a lot to go through. So I would like to, I don't know. I, I get a lot of conversations with people that I talk to. There's some people who are really, really good of getting people to open up about certain things. And one of the main questions I get from people who are really good. Um, icebreakers amongst getting to know strangers is what is the one superpower that you wish you could have if if you could just wish for it and you would get it and you know this is like people go down the line of all the different superhero characters like Superman or you know the different character powers that are out there and like my my default is usually I get asked this a lot you know what it does it tells a lot you if it tells you a lot about the other person. Because if you ask why they want that power, they'll go into a lot of different things on that. It's a great conversation opener for someone you just meet. You know, hey, this is someone, this is something I just asked new people I just met because I want to kind of know a little more. And what is the one superpower? The one superpower that I have actually found to be the most fascinating, whenever there is uh, either a villain or even the superhero that has it, is mind control. Um, has anybody seen Jessica Jones on Netflix? That, that series and the, the 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 bad guy actually had the power of mind control, but he can control you, make you think things and make you do things in that way. But mind control is something that's kind of really interesting because in a small way, marketers today and psychologists and there's so many so different many things that are influential. And I mean, you're in that in that field that there's so many things that the brain can be influenced to do things even subconsciously without you even knowing. I'm not talking hypnosis. Uh, so Robert Cialdini is actually a professor in that field, and he was the one to write the book called Influence, which when he first wrote it, nobody cared about. 
it didn't take off at all because it was a way ahead of its time. Nobody did or even wanted to accept the fact that by doing your own type of study on, what do you call it, data? Oh, I can't remember what he called it. But where you take data, and actually data tells you what people are more apt to do. In, in their, especially when it comes to the, the, the part of marketing. So I, I honestly think that mind control is one of the most powerful things that can actually be done as a superpower. I mean, you think that if you can control the masses, and that's all you have to do is think and then tell everybody what to do, and they will just do it. Hitler, if you think about it, he started wars. You know, and everything that he did was very, very persuasive based on so many factors that were all part of that. It was like he had the perfect storm of that superpower behind him. But it's still even done today, even marketers. I mean, I've actually been involved on the victim end of a super elaborate scam of somebody coming in and trying to influence us to go ahead and he had so many people involved that had no idea that they were actually putting together pieces for us to be influenced or even persuaded to give up a few thousand dollars or something. And after it was all put together and the guy took off with our money, we went back to these certain people and they were like, no, he's been here for a few days asking these questions, setting things up, putting him, this is in Vegas and he actually stayed in a Vegas hotel and he was, um, had offered my father-in-law business opportunity. Uh, to run certain things. He'd done his, every, even to the extent where when we went into the casino manager's office, the casino manager office of, uh, manager played along with the whole thing of us actually, yes, there's an opportunity for this is going on. And he had no idea he was part of the scam that was going on. He was just answering questions. He had put it together so elaborately. And it was really a fascinating, upsetting, you know, um, situation that happened but it's it's something that's really available and this book actually is really cool about it, how much it talks about the different things that can be done so Sun Tzu says every battle is won even before it is fought and you know if you think about that it's because of the way that things are put together a lot earlier and I'm gonna go actually this, this part was when I had I was waiting for my car to get serviced so I was able to go through some really High end notes, but I want to talk more about just the influential parts so that we can go through this as quickly as possible so that we get all of the main good, I guess, um, goodies from the book that, that was available to it. Uh, I highly recommend you, uh, you pick it up and get it. So, one of the things he talks about is uh, he has great stories in it. So, the part that says story up there at the top uh, in here, he talks about a consultant who, like a lot of consulting people who go into different areas, they're actually asked to make a proposal. So when he used to put his proposal together to his clients, he would actually lay it out so that it was exactly what it would be in the cost that he's estimating it at. Now, problem was his competitors would all buffer their bids, knowing that the client was probably gonna go ahead and try to negotiate down. He didn't feel that that was right. Just to put an extra 10% so he could bring it down 10% so that he could get the sale. He would know, just say, this is it straight up. But what happens was when he brought it out there and he said, this is what it will be. I'm, you know, there's not, I didn't leave any room for buffering so that we could negotiate down. This is the best price that it is. He came off as being unreasonable and not flexible. And he would lose a lot of things that happened that way. But lo and behold, one day, he was sitting down with a client and he actually said, well, obviously I can't charge a million dollars for this. But this is the rate. And it was $75,000 on the billing. And the guy looked at it and he says, well, obviously you can't charge a million, but $75,000, sure, no problem. By planting the seed of a higher dollar value that was exuberant, he was able to go ahead and find out that he could persuade people or influence or convince that the rate that he was charging is a fair rate just because of that seed that was planted higher. And that's what's called persuasion. That's kind of a good example of it. You set something up without even really intentionally knowing. So now later on, we'll go into how even giving somebody a hot cup of coffee or a hot cup in their hand can actually be, make them more susceptible to be warmer to other people and those type of, or images. There's a really, really good story. And this is later on in the notes, but I just think it's so fascinating. People were shown a picture of people who were close together, like either hugging or just close in vicinity where it showed cooperation and those types of things. And they noticed, and this is set up, 
that the person who was showing the picture set it up so that they would drop their pen on purpose. And they would say, they would show that when they were shown a picture that was separated, those people were less apt to help out the person get it. Where the others, when they were shown pictures that were actually closer together, those subjects were like three times more likely to go in and be susceptible to going ahead and taking action and helping out the person. What's cool about this is that he didn't tell you to the end that when they did this study, it was working with 18 month olds, kids, babies. Yeah, and now it, the same thing worked for adults as well because of what was being planted, but even the human nature of those type of just little images can actually influence people to do certain actions and things. So, um, yeah. No, so he. What's interesting? Yeah. Infomercials. Correct. Yes. Yes. So here's something interesting about suit places. It's not so much by actually offering a higher dollar value of that item to bring it down, but to show a higher dollar amount then lessens the value of smaller dollar amount. So there another in the, I think his other book called Influence. When somebody walks into a suit um, store, like the one that just opened up there, uh, Men's Warehouse was actually, if you watch how they do it, I think they, that's where you maybe got the example from, but they will not upsell you anything until after you've actually committed to the highest dollar product. They can sell you a tie. If you were to walk in and they say, have you seen their sale on the ties? And ties are like 17 to 25 bucks on that, which is not a bad deal depending on the tie. Most people would say, oh, I could probably get a better deal at somewhere else, you know. But once you're into the act of actually buying a jacket or a suit and you're already committing to about $500 to $1,500, putting on a tie of an extra 15 to 25 bucks is nothing. They start just throwing, which is why auto dealers wait till the end before they start throwing on all this other stuff, all this other little things on there. Oh, yes, the, the top, seriously, I think when we went mattress shopping, it was like 1200 bucks for the mattress, and all of a sudden, we spent an extra $400 on the, that extra protection thing and the other thing on there, uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, the, the one set, because you're already there, well, you're already spending on this money, go ahead, and, and, and you don't think it would, yeah, if you if you went down to um, JCPenney, it would have been only 20 bucks, you know, so that that's one of the things, this is all, it's all the, the mindset of people, have, yeah. So I was gonna have you guys do this. Half the room was gonna get a little card uh, that was gonna have. I'm gonna have you draw a short line. So he talks about this as an, an example. Half the one half the room would actually draw a long line, and the other half the room would draw a short line. And then we'd throw up an image of the Mississippi River with some estimates of how long you think it is. And what happens is statistically, the people who drew a longer line will estimate longer on the Mississippi River. Well, the other half will all estimate shorter if they do a shorter line because your mind gets into a certain kind of mode or a setting in that way. So it's really cool on how you can do it. Now, when, how does it relate to marketing? So one thing that they noticed was with the couch seller, there was the firm couch that was very economical, sturdy, would last a long time, and then they had the fluffy, soft, comfortable um, type of couch that was on there. And then there's this one manufacturer was selling both of these couches. And what they noticed was when they tried to go in and push, or they were talking more about the couch that was actually more um, sturdy, economical, made more financial sense, if they put pennies on the background to kind of give that image behind it, they noticed a lot more people search the pages about the durability, about the cost, about what they're saving and all that. But if they put clouds on the background of the web page, then they would notice that a lot more people would talk about the comfort and the soft side of the couch itself on there. So you have the, all of these different type of things that the persuasion, things before you can you need to start influencing or can start doing it, will put people's mindsets in certain areas. The other thing that they noticed with that couch situation was when they put two other manufacturers' couches that were also sturdy and firm and long-lasting, then the interest in the soft couch just skyrocketed. So they were, I mean, 
So the common, or most people would think, well, if you have three of the more economical sturdier cows, then you'd actually be losing sales because you have two other manufacturers that are challenging your one manufacturer of all the same type of cows. But what it did was it actually made more focus on the thing that was unique. And that's why that one actually went up in sale on that way. So there's that's other things that are in there. Um, but I want to go through just some brief points of things that can help you if you're having websites or you're doing some marketing on other things. Oh, so um, the other example of this, which I thought was really cool, this people are willing to spend more at dinner on a place called Studio 97 than if the space was called Studio 17. Just because the dog, I mean, because the, the name has a higher higher amount, those, they actually will really be willing to spend more money. And there's other examples of that, of when people will be willing to spend more money on certain things. Um, so athlete performance improved when people were, when they found that the, the athlete was wearing higher numbers than lower numbers. Uh, this is the estimate one I was telling you about with the, but, um, when people were asked to write down higher digits in their social security number, that they're willing to pay more for a box of chocolates on a test. So yeah, it's like write down the two highest numbers in your social security number, and then after that, you ask them how much would you buy for chocolates. People were willing to pay more after they had written down a higher number on this stuff. Um, oh, so if you have a wine shop and you want to push more of the German wines, they played German music, and they found that more people bought German wines. Same thing with French, the French wines. If they play music that was actually um, of that area or region, they noticed that more French wines were actually bought too. So these things are a little, so these are the notes that I were taking when I was doing my walking. <laughs> you can tell they're just like notes. So mystery. What I want to talk about mystery here is he was talking about how if you want to keep people's attention, make it into something that's almost a mystery, that gets people thinking about what your content and where they have to, they're trying to figure it out, almost like a puzzle. And you can actually get people to get more interested in what you have on there. Now, as a teacher, he figured out there, of course, as a teacher of trying to get people interested in his subject, what he would do is he would start with the story, but he wouldn't give them the ending until the end of class. He said it was so powerful that typically in college, and he talks about this, because I remember exactly five minutes till the class is over and you know it is, the first person who closes their book makes everybody start closing their book. And it's, the bags start to zipper, everything else starts to happen. He forgot his timing was off, and he didn't even get to the end of it. And he realized that the time when class was up, nobody had closed their books, nobody had put their bags away. And then he was trying to finish up class, and, then, and people started telling him, we need to know the end of the story before we can go. And so that's the kind of thing that's actually really powerful. If you think about that in your copywriting, it can be a very powerful thing to keep messages on. And you see that all the time. You know, like, do you know what's really special about this phone? Well, let me tell you that. Wait, let's get that to get to that later. And then we'll talk about other things, and then they get all the way back to the end. They keep you hanging. And that's the mystery aspect of, of the attention. Um, un so how to make things more memorable is the unfinished thought. So he gave an example of they were he was with a whole bunch of other professors and students at this restaurant. And they were just marveling at the waiter who could remember everybody's meals without writing anything down so what they did was after he had put all of the plates down they wanted to really see what was the magic behind him doing this and they wanted to test him on it so after everybody got their plates they literally all got their napkins and covered up their food asked them to come back and this was just minutes after the food was all laid out asked them to come back and see to to name everybody's um, order he couldn't do it after the first one and they figured out it was because he had completed the process, so his brain just let it go. So now if you want to remember something, don't finish it to its completion on certain areas that you want to do that. You can actually leave it incomplete. There's also another uh, podcast I was listening to about how to get stuff done, and one way to get things more productively done is you start it and you leave it. If you, don't, you, wanna, like, if you need to know you need to get something done tomorrow, like if, especially if you're a writer or a blogger, or even somebody who's going to be writing copy, and you want to get start it, and your body, your mind will actually be compelled to try to finish it. And so when you come back and sit down, you're already halfway through the process, and your mind has not actually closed off that process because you started it. So that's one way to get back to stuff that's really quick. Um, I have a coworker who never shuts down his computer, 
and always leaves up the last document. Even when he's doing, like the next day, he's out, he'll start like seven different emails and start them and because he's just running out of time he, and it doesn't need to be done that day. But that way, when he first comes in the next day, he can knock it out really quick because he says that he can get started on it so much faster because it's already there. Not so much because he had to restart it because his mind mental process really never finished it. For me, I don't know if I'd be able to sleep <laughs> if I left all of those stuff open at the end of the night. I got to start kind of fresh in the day, but he talks about that too. Um, favors and trust. So one another big part of this, oh, actually Pavlov's changes. So everybody, has anybody not heard of Pavlov's dogs? And, and the, the, you know, he rang the bell and they started drooling. Well, there's, a, I guess, a whole part of that story that nobody ever heard about is that Pavlov, Whenever he tried to show this example to somebody elsewhere outside of the lab, it never worked. Like, and even his assistant. So his assistant said, I mean, they were all frustrated about this point. Whenever they took the dogs into even the other room to show this example and they rang the bell, the dog wouldn't uh, react to it. And same thing when actually Pavlov tried to go ahead and do this example outside of the lab completely, or with just even in the lab with new people in it, the dogs wouldn't react to it. And it was because of the distraction and the focus that the dogs were actually now focused on what's around there. Um, I have a dog that actually will lie down, roll over, jump when I say jump, spin around when I say spin around, and even sit. But if there's other dogs around, she will not respond to me whatsoever. She's just so distracted. And, and it's one of those things. So the, he goes into about understanding um, the changes of actual different rooms, different areas, and why sometimes when you think, oh, I got to go ahead and uh, get me a cup of coffee, when you walk into the kitchen, all of a sudden you forget why you were there. It's because the changing is now your focus and your mind can actually just jump off of stuff. So one way to get people to stay focused on something is not to change too much stuff. And then he talks a little bit about that as well. Um, confessions. I don't remember what that one was about. Um, favors and trust. So favors and trust, when he talks about, if you ask somebody, and this is, I guess, uh, commonly known with NLP, when you ask somebody, can you do me a favor, a small thing, can you just hold this? There's actually a trust barrier that gets dropped that actually gets, makes people become more trusting. You can become more influential or they can, they're be more apt to actually do something. And he has a really good example of a salesman that he went around with throughout, um, they sold security systems, I think is what it was. So he was going around with the top salesman because they're trying. He was trying to figure out why were this guy was so successful. What was his technique and style? Everybody was trained to do the same thing, but what he figured out was he noticed this guy did the same thing. That every time they walked in and they sat down and they started the presentation, he would say, "Oh, I have to go get something from the car." In the meantime, do you mind filling out some information so that I have a little bit of idea about you know his prospects that were in there? He'd go out to the car. And he, before he left, he said, do you mind if I just let myself back in so you can finish off the paperwork? The people said, no, no problem. He'd go, he'd come back in, he'd sit down with them. And then all of a sudden, the whole disposition of the meeting would be changed different than other salesmen that, that didn't do this technique. And he was thinking, why does it happen? Every time that he has this meeting, he kind of plays the fool, like he forgot something, walks out, lets himself back in and sits down. Well, the salesman then actually then revealed the reason why he does that is his success rate is so high is the only people that you let come back into your house are people you trust. So when somebody leaves and comes back, subconsciously at a level, you have now actually given them a level of trust that you normally don't give a regular salespeople. And his closing rate became a lot higher. Actually, his closing rate was just way better than anybody else's. So that's actually the, the trust factor that he goes on. Steve, if you, if you have anything, I, I mean, because that's your profession, do you have anything? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I, I'd love to hear because I mean. So Pavlov's dog is classical conditioning, mm -hmm. which is which is when you pair something, something so like every time you come here, you handed us cookies, mm -hmm. right? Unless let's say I were to come here like on a Wednesday night to use this room for something else, I might start feeling like a trigger for this. <laughs> That's what Pavlov's dog is: classical conditioning versus offering conditioning, which is something else. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention earlier is that there's a whole field called neuromarketing. Mm -hmm. where they're actually looking at physiology. So I'm a therapist. I'm a feedback therapist. So I'm looking at heart rate and muscle tension and brain waves. So, so there's this whole field where they, they really look at what, what people's reactions are when they're walking down the aisle and they're looking at a product and what, what it might mean to them. 
So. They're actually studying that, like. Oh, yeah, Huh. Oh yeah. So here's so it's off, a little bit off subject, but this is something that's really interesting. I am going to predict in about two years the whole United States will be switching over to a system almost called like WeChat. Have you? Has anybody heard of WeChat? WeChat. So if you go to China today, you're going to notice everywhere and anywhere they accept payments called WeChat. It's basically Facebook, Skype, PayPal, Apple Pay, um, Messenger, everything that's really all you can think about that most people will use when it comes to social media and everyday usage is all on their phones now. Everything. They walk in and out. And from my understanding, you can even go to a restaurant and you'd actually say, I'm going to pay, and you pay it on your phone, and it actually pays the bill. And they know when you're walking out that you've already paid. It's like just really fascinating thing that's going on in China. They don't take credit cards. In fact, hotels are, I think, the only places that are still taking credit cards. Most of them discourage it. They'll actually tell you, get a WeChat account, hook your credit card up to it. And everything you do now is all being done through WeChat. <laughs> this is China. So you know who owns WeChat? The government. Or uh, if it's a company, uh, there's no if, ands, or buts. The government has their hands in it. So, but the thing is, anybody who's gone there or that travels there a lot, they find it to be the most convenient thing ever. And this is interesting because um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been hacked and I have issues with security and all that. And when I started mentioning, if the Chinese government owns that and we are actually integrated into a system that's something like that. That means the Chinese government know, can know everything and anything that they can about members of what you do. I mean, uh, the whole United States population in that way. Um, what is that? There is, yep. Yeah. And you know, but who's to say they don't already know that? I mean, if Facebook got hacked and they were able to steal everything on the back end information about everybody who has a profile on there, would Facebook tell us? Probably not. I wouldn't be surprised if China already has all that information. You know, but when you integrate now all your buying habits, Everything into that because Facebook knows your buying habits. I mean, that's one thing that it's, it's really good at doing is figuring everything else on that. But when it comes to convenience, they say, like I said, everything is done on this one app, even purchasing everything. In fact, my understanding is that most of the people there that actually eat lunches, like at business offices, they'll actually punch in what they want, pay it online, and within 25 minutes or so, their lunch is being walked in the door by somebody. It's and it's very it's kind of. Oh yes, every restaurant every in China restaurant. does that now. Yeah. Like I said, I guess so. I mean, I mean, they nobody uses it. I mean, but Apple Pay is more prevalent that I've seen here and there in different places. The thing about it is that it, we're so have so many different places with the Chinese government being able to control everything. They can force businesses, to, but they don't have to anymore. They, they basically told all the businesses, look, there's no fees. And that's why they, they don't want to take credit cards because they have to pay 2 to 3% fees on everything that's going out. But with WeChat, there's no fees on it. And, but the, the advertising potential that's behind there is why probably the government's taking care of it. They understand what they can do with that. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. So that's another thing is it is predicted that actually China is going to be the first cur current Currency less or yeah, currency free? Yes, they're not. They're done, they won't be doing anything with currency, which is really interesting because I heard Bitcoin is now also going to be traded on the open market soon. You know, so if that can happen, and then they can do Bitcoin on that side of the world, and it's now there's no international trade fees. I don't know enough about um, digital currency yet. It, that's too weird to me that it fluctuates so much up and down. Thinking now, but that's uh, something that to keep an eye on what's going to be going on because if it can be that powerful and save that much people money. Businesses may be transferring over to something like WeChat. If Facebook or Google or somebody can integrate that into their systems, that would be pretty powerful as well. Um, so another thing is the contrast I was talking about was the like the couches. Um, oh, so surveys. By actually asking people to take surveys, you can increase demand of stuff. And that's what's amazing. So if people are, if you start asking people about um, what are your buying habits? 
uh, when you go to a car dealership. Do, do you like you know this and that? It can actually get you in a mood to start thinking about buying a car. And I don't know if you've ever had that happen to me, but I can think of many instances when I'm taking a survey, when I'm done and I actually think about buying whatever I was actually surveying or something like that. Um, but they talk about how powerful it is when it actually is done in a controlled setting and that's what they're trying to do, that you can actually influence people to buy something or become more, because they start focusing on it. So that's another thing that was in there. Um, being across, oh. So being across from, uh, from someone you want to influence, never next to them. So that, yeah, so here's a, it's more of a conference room setting is his example. So if you're sitting in a room where you actually want to influence somebody, whoever is the decision maker, if you're actually going to be doing a sales presentation of some sort, you don't want to sit next to them, uh, especially if it's going to be something that's going to be going around the circle type of environment. If that person has to be thought, uh, is going to be thinking of saying something. So what's a better example? If somebody is there so that they have to say a presentation or do something, they're not going to be thinking about anything you say until their presentation is done. And in fact, even after their presentation is done, they're going to be critiquing themselves in their mind that they won't be paying attention to anything you have to say. So if the person that you need to go and communicate to is lined up to talk, do not sit in a position right before or right after their presentation has been done. You want to sit there so that after it's done, they've already had time to either dissipate their thoughts of what they've done or that they are not worrying about what they're going to say. So it's, it's actually a really interesting thing because you can ask that person who's sitting next to you if it's a round table type thing, what did that person say? They're less likely to remember anything that's next to them that was left or right of them. So that's what that's another thing is, and that's a persuasive technique of making sure that you're, if you're going to try to go and persuade somebody, make sure that you position yourself on the other side of that. Um, Linking, association are the building blocks of thought. So linking is actually where you're able to go ahead and associate yourself with somebody else. You're linking yourself to them. And they talk a lot about how language is, is a good example of um, when people speak the same type of dialects, same type of accent. If you know, there's one person from the south and another person from the same area and they have the same accent and they're in a room that has nobody else, they're going to actually take a higher liking to each other than anybody else because of familiarity. And you can do that with all different times. Ethnicities is a big thing, but language is another. I guess he gave an example of um, South Korean missionaries that went to the Middle East that were taken by the Taliban. There were 12 of them. Two of them were executed right away, just to give show of force an example of power. And all negotiations with the Taliban were just crumbling. And their timelines were actually, in fact, they had already named that they were going to kill these two more people in a matter of time. So. The South Korean government sent somebody over, and they actually, whoever was going over, wisely took somebody who spoke natively the language of the Taliban members there. And because of that alone, they asked why, they, they actually thought there was no, there was going to be no success of getting the, um, the rest of the captives released. All of the, the hostages were finally released, and when they asked why that happened, and he, the main person from the South Korean government said, is because they actually brought somebody who spoke the language. <laughs> directly, there was no translating in between on their end. Where the Taliban actually had English people that were understanding English from the Taliban and translating to their own people, where this time they brought, I guess, somebody with them that was on their side that actually spoke the language. And that influence alone broke down a lot of the barriers that was able to get them negotiating. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but it's kind of funny when somebody, I, I, there's some really smooth talkers out there and somebody, like my wife will introduce herself, Oh, hi. And then, you know, I said, this is my wife, Karen. And then my, that person will say, oh, my mom's name is Karen, even though it's not. I mean, we don't question them, but I know that it, what is the possibility that their name is Karen? But they'll do that. And I, 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 don't, I don't know if they have something that they've learned as a technique, but when there's some type of relation of that, especially when it comes to people's name, it can be really powerful. So it's also been proven like if you have somebody with the same birth date, stockbrokers, who actually have very similar birthdates or close to birthdays, and they use that technique of saying, oh, that's my birthday as well, can actually get clients to put a lot more money into accounts and that they can broker on that type of things. I actually had that happen. I was at kind of a meeting with some mm -hmm. I forget. Why this guy said it was his birthday. Mm -hmm. and I, oh my God, that's my birthday. And all of a sudden, he was like, like, 
my new son or something. Oh, yes. Yep. Well, you're talking about matching. I saw an experiment. They asked some people from the South. They had a guy from New York talk, and they said, tell us about that man. He said, it's obviously a con man. You know, they talk fast and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Then they asked the guy from New York what he thought about the people from the South. They talked a little slower and all that. The prejudices. Just from the language, and they found that when the people from the South spoke at the same speed that the New Yorker did, they thought, oh, they're, they're smart people. And when people from New York slowed down their talk, then, they, you know, the relationship, the levels of, yeah, the liking and the liking of people, it's pretty interesting, but it is uh, associations, of, like he said, he puts it as it's the, um, the building blocks of thought. And um, so then there's another example. I listened to this like three or four times because it just really intrigued me. Violent language, example of shock afterwards. So this example was there were people that were in, um, I guess, kind of a study. So Half the room, you were going to give in some words that were mixed up. There were like three words, like um, me hit the, or me hit, or him hit me. Okay, and then so you're given words that like door open, please. And so what you'd have to do is you'd have to put these words together to make a sentence that was it. So you would say it's like, oh, he hit me, and you say open the door or something like that. So this side of the room were actually used violent words like hitting. Um, terminating, or and the other side of the room had totally random words that were not actually really of any type of uh, structure of violence of those type of things. And then what they did was those same people were then taken to a room and they were going to go ahead and <laughs> give shock treatment to people who made mistakes of some sort. Or uh, and they found that by far people who actually were doing all of the words that actually had some type of violent or aggressive terms in them were way out. To give way more aggressive shock treatment or um, penalties, I guess, than the people who actually had nothing to do with it. And there, there are a lot of examples that he goes into, like even video games today. You know, in the, the aggressive video games, there are, there's all these people who say that there's studies that say that they can make people more aggressive and studies that say that they don't. But there's also studies that say that people who play games that are even aggressive at nature are way more apt to be more teamwork oriented. It's really interesting on what actually it does influence and what it doesn't, but there's like studies that they were talking about on how those type of things do. Now it makes sense, of course, you know, uh, violent type things constantly over make you a little more numb to things that can be around you based on that. Um, so another thing is that, so thinking about the violent language, he was talking about how, you know, if you're walking to like some of these business oriented meetings and then, or businesses, and they have those signs that say, Perseverance, succeed, achieve, and uh, yeah, hang it all, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so the successories, right? Like that's what they call them. And they actually said they've. That's a story. It's called successories, I guess. But they actually do have studies that show elevated levels of achievement or actually um, better results with offices that actually have those type of things in there. It does influence the mind. To do certain things. Now, the other thing that is can also be done with when it comes to just actually getting into the mind of somebody that can actually improve or lessen performance. So I'm I was on my second roundabout. I'm at this section right now where he talks about how putting women all together in one room, um, students, and men all together in another room, students do it. And when they're taking a test, that if it's a math test and somebody actually asks them, or they, they have to write down their gender. That just by writing down their gender, their scores are actually dropped down lower when it came to certain type of subject matters. I think it was math, and um, they, oh, I'm sorry, they separated the room, where some of the females went into. I don't know why it was actually. He was talking mostly about females, but he talked about females that were in one side in one room. They were told to actually write down their gender, and other whole bunch of females that were in that didn't write down their gender, and the, the scores were. Uh, Obviously, Obviously different. different. That was very, very um, considerable and different. But using the same technique and having somebody do like a woman who has been really successful in math prior to that, talking to the gender that, that they're actually studying by actually, I guess, 
going against the, um, the stereotype that maybe these students were actually put into made a big difference on that as well. And the same thing went with um, using ethnicity, where I guess there is a pre, um, I don't know, uh, he talked about how Asian women, where they, when they were told to put down their, uh, their ethnicity and they were Asians, they were actually, they saw a higher increase in score because of the stereotype that actually gets put into their mind that Asians are supposed to be better at math. There was improved score to that. But, um, so he talks about those type of things of the uh, different achievements that we're doing. Uh, and also by words, uh, in this one, Beast vs. Virus, there is a campaign that was run by mayors about calling the violence in the city, using it as a, an example of it's a beast that has to be caged up. And then another, uh, the other mayor also, instead of using the word beast, called it virus. It's a virus that actually has to be cured. And there was a whole psychological study behind what people thought about when they actually heard the terms and what they were thinking about visually in their minds when they thought about the violence and about curing it and caging it up and the terms or the type of responses that were coming out of it. So the, just words that are being used, especially when it comes to copy, you should really have people read, like three or four other people read your copy that's on your websites or anything else and ask them what are they thinking? What do they feel when they go through it? Because certain words can make things softer. You know what's funny? Stephen and I were talking about this in sales, and I'd love to get your opinion on this. But we were talking about using a sales pitch that says, when it comes to advertising, especially with Google, I almost see it as if you start to advertise using Google ads and you get your ad higher than your competition, you are actually, in a way, stealing the, the potential customers from your client or from, from your competitors. Because you, by you not being there, they had the number one spot, they were getting all the calls that were coming in. Now, if you take the number one spot in an ad, then you'll get a, a smaller, a, a small percentage of that that they would, they should have gotten, or a large percentage, depending on where your ranking is. So the pitch was going to be more of, you know, get a higher ranking and steal the customers that you deserve from your, away from your competition. My wife, I, she ranted. I it must have been for days, and even got her coworkers involved, saying that. They're going to go after this. Uh, they're stealing. Don't use the word steal. It's, it just makes a really bad image. And I, I got it. I mean, she was so adamant about it. But I thought, you know, it's just a powerful word because it does actually. It depends on the business, the type of business. Because I think certain businesses, it's more powerful to steal the customers. Yeah. Than to steal the customers. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but she said, is, it, is there ever a time when the word steal is actually put in a very positive connotation? And I said, no. She, I mean, I agreed with her in the end. I, mean, I was just kind of fighting with her just to fight with her to see how far she would take it with her in that way. But she was, it was funny because she, she made such a big deal about it. And, but she was right. The word steal, it actually does, what does it make in your business? Uh, what kind of image does it put in? Yeah. Yeah, and that's, she, that's the thing. I think for her, it actually made her feel as though she's working with someone who's a little dishonest just because of the word, you know? But you don't have to use, she said you do not have to use the word steal. You can always rephrase it in another way of get the customers that you're, you're even, you know, or protect the customers you should be getting that your competition's stealing from you. You know, don't put it in that you're taking it away from them. So yeah, she went through this whole thing about it. But, you know, when I'm going through this book, I can really understand what people might feel subconsciously about the word steal and putting in our content on that one. Um, oh, so like another good example is there's an assurance salesman. <laughs> this is a funny, because actually I have, um, I have a life insurance license. Um, I don't um, sell it actively, but because I've gotten it, I don't ever want to let it expire because I don't want to go to school if I ever decide to go back on it. But I know a lot about insurance sales. And the only thing I sell is life insurance. That's the only thing, because I really believe in it. It's a necessity that people should have so to sell life insurance is really I don't it's a really touchy thing because you can say the word die death and you can totally see the disposition of clients when people just completely cave in 
like now it's a reality that they're going to die. And everybody knows that they're going to die. But it, sometimes it can get hard past that barrier of certain things. So there's this example that he's given of there's a salesman who was so phenomenal at what he did and how he did it that they actually had this certain um, month named after this guy. He was actually in the hospital. He had already retired. I think he was retired or he was sick. But they um, put up a in honor of him being such a great salesman, they called it a, a something challenge, like Mr. Smith challenge, which is Mr. Smith was in the hospital. Well, at the end of the month, Mr. Smith still won the competition, selling like $80 million worth of um, life insurance. And they asked him how he did it. He did it from his hospital bed, because he was literally in there. But it was his passion. So one of the things that he did was he, he talks about the words that he used, he said, people don't die. Whenever he sells it, he says they walk out of life. And the type of mindset that comes out of that is that because you're selling insurance literally so that you're protecting when you leave this planet, that you're protecting the people who are left behind. Well, this is the imagery that he leaves behind when you walk out of life, you know, that that's going to be left behind, that then people actually are more happy. They're more open to it. His persuasive technique was actually to use that. So I thought that was pretty cool. People, I gotta remember that. I'm gonna actually probably like walk right down on my business card if I ever decide to go back. They walk out of life. Um, so this is the touch power that I was talking about. He said, hot drinks make people more giving. Uh, heavy clipboards or even e-readers make subconsciously they find that people think whatever is in the content of what they have is more important. One of the things that they found is they, they tried to make e-readers really, really light because people complained how heavy they were. Sales started dropping, and then what they found out is psych psychologically people felt that the content just wasn't as good, wasn't as important anymore because of the whatever they were physically holding and touching was actually lighter. So the other thing that he talks about is if somebody who is giving you an interview has a heavier clipboard, they are more apt to actually think you're more important than if they were to have a light clipboard. Um, I don't know what the physical part of that makes that so much more important, but uh, that's what he talks about on that. <laughs> you know what? Robert Cialdini does not have a soft cover book on a, a lighter, <laughs> you know. I don't know, maybe if it's too soon that he's gotten this out, but I noticed that every time I tried to look for it, there was no um, the paperback book yet. And I wonder if that's purposeful, to see if he could do it, if you think about what he's doing. It. So. Um, Self-connection, so I talk about the birthday power, uh, even power of initials. Oh, and this one. You guys remember when Coca-Cola did that promotion where you could give somebody bottles with their names on it? They had personalized bottles. So Coca-Cola made, um, I don't know, like the top 50 names or 35 names in the United States, and they put it over the bottle, and they said, give uh, a Coke out to your friend. And when they did that promotion, it was the first time in 10 years that Coca-Cola saw an increase in sales because of the name factor on it. Yeah, because you could buy a, like, what is that? Exactly. But you know what more so is their whole sales pitch or their whole promotion was give a friend. My wife went out to go buy bottles. Oh, yeah? Did you buy your own or did, did something? Yes, exactly. Isn't that funny? She bought one for as many people as she could find that actually had their name and gave it out. Yeah, it's really interesting. So that's how important the name is. That can be a very persuasive factor on that way as well. Uh, talked about language and accents. Oh, rhymes. So those of us who are in sales, and uh, if you can actually put a title or subject line, and if there's a way to make it rhyme, it is actually more influential. It can actually increase conversions and attention for it and make it more memorable. That's, I guess, another factor of that. Um, the, and likewise, they have found that if it's difficult to pronounce your name, you are actually less likely to be higher up in levels of corporate America. You're also less likely to get clients if that's actually like a, maybe a attorney business. People are more apt to actually take on or work with people whose names are easier to pronounce and read. So if your name is harder, a, a good thing to do is actually get um, what do you call that? A nickname that's easier. My my father-in-law's first name Haruhiko, and he says, "Call me George." <laughs> and, you know, and, it, and nobody knows his real name after that, but it is. It's because it's so easy to remember and say. Uh, he's a lot. Well, if it's an American name, exactly, and that's. Or if you're in a different country, then you have. 
For that language. Yeah. So even um, my mother-in-law, her name is Tomie, T-O-M-I-E. And she just says, everybody says, call me Tommy. And it makes it easier for that way. So it gets easier to do that. Um, for some reason, they say if it's more easy to read, and it's more, it becomes more trusting and more believable. Or you become more believable. So that's one of the things that they say. Uh, even company names, they say to actually make your company name something easier. My, my actual LLC is Miyamoto Development. Not an easy name to say, read, or spell. So, I mean, that's something that something to consider. Probably going to make it a little easier in, in the future if a uh, company comes out. Solid Search Marketing was a really easy name for us to go ahead and have on that one. Um, so later in the book, this is after the first one. This is one that really fascinated me was the um, Warren Buffett. Whenever he gives his quarterly company updates about what he does, he always starts off with talking about the problems that they had, always. And it's a fascinating thing because he actually, Berkshire Hathaway is the number one most valuable stock in the world. Like one share is well over six figures, right? I mean, it's like huge. But the trust factor behind the way Warren Buffett <coughs> gets people to, to really stay and continuously feel as though they can trust him is whether or not he did it on purpose, which probably did, is he always starts off with the problems because anybody who's psychologically people feel if you're willing to go in and give up all the bad stuff that's out there first, they're more apt to accept the good stuff behind you as trusting because you're, they don't feel as though that you're trying to hide anything since you've said all the bad things that were going on. It's something that can be used, and it's actually used quite often in a lot of sales copy that I do uh, on certain places that, that depending on what you're trying to sell now. So something to think about. Uh, what was the number? Was it Hertz or Avis? Hertz was number one. Yeah, so we're not. We're, we're number two, and we try, but we try harder, you know. And that whole that thing, it catapulted their visibility in their sales. I mean, it was really a, a fantastic thing. Not trying to claim number one, just their benefits there. Um, okay, so okay, so environmental cues. One thing to go ahead if you want to be working on certain something, if you have copy that you're going to be writing. It's a good idea to actually put your potential audience. It'll actually help you write your copy. Your brain will actually start to communicate directly to them. So he, Robert Cialdini found out every time he tried to write about his book or write his book at his office in the school, and he went home to read it, it was so technical. Every time he wrote from home, where he was looking out the window, a street where people were walking, that he actually communicated at a level where the public could understand it. Because he's a professor, you know, he, he can, his brain switches back and forth based on his environment. He also found that when um, marketing students or marketing people who are doing certain types of ideas, putting things together, when they put their potential audience or who they're targeting in front of them, pictures of it, they, could, they found that their creativity, their ideas of everything that they're putting together actually worked out a lot better. Um, I talked about the gender of stereotype and togetherness. Yes. That response. Oh, so the, the togetherness about the pictures got 30% higher response than people helping out, even on the 18 year old kids. And then um, happy faces can make people pay more and drink more. <laughs> that's what he talks about. So that's kind of actually some of the coolest stuff that's in the book. There's a lot more that, like I said, we going quite a bit. I highly recommend if anybody has time to go and do that. The next thing is also the big leap. This one is fast, short read, really help you get a lot of uh, ideas into it. Now, that covered a lot. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> but yeah, there's so uh, the, um, the Barnes & Noble buyer, I told her buy the book called Influence by, it's, it's also by the same author. And I don't know, how how this one came up, but it ended up being a comic book um, about yeah the science and practice of influence. So I'm gonna pick up a copy. There's only one extra. She said that it was not refundable on their end, so they only bought two. But uh, I'll let you know how it is. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I guarantee. I guarantee there is an influential reason behind that too, because of knowing just who he is. Uh, this one is twelve ninety five. Uh, persuasion is twenty eight. 
I think the audio was 30. Yeah, but if you do, if you do, if you do, um, uh, you know, if you go audible.com and you sign up for a month and then just cancel it after, you can get it for 14 because it's 14.99 a month, right? No. What is that? Oh, so the power of influence. They found out one of the, the I guess, the most dreaded fears amongst performers, like, you know, um, musicians and even actors or even people who are speaking is that there's something called, uh, I guess, I, I forgot the name of it, but it's when somebody, if there's a, somebody who starts to cough, it be, can become an epidemic within a crowd. It can, yes, it can make, yeah. So, that, I mean, they, they said that they, it's, it's, I guess, one of the biggest fears. If somebody starts to cough in it, it can make other people. And he gives examples of how somebody starts to cough and then I mean, it was at a conference, and the speaker was, and it was at a health conference nonetheless. Somebody started coughing. Everybody, Everybody started coughing. The CDC actually made, because I guess they were there, made people evacuate the building thinking that there was something in the air on that way. And then it caused, the same thing happens when somebody says, oh, there's a gas leak in the area. If, if you feel nauseous, if you feel headaches, if you start, yeah. And then, yeah, so whole schools were shut down. 70% of the people said they had all these symptoms, went to the hospital, and then they came back and found out there was no leak. You know, so that, but then they, they, <laughs> medical students, and this is something I've heard of before, but medical school students, when they're actually going through all the different diseases, the, the professors will tell them, you will think you have this, okay, but you do not, okay? And no matter what they do, they still said there's a 70% um, of, of the student body will go and say that they have these diseases and they do the studying of these things. And so it's really powerful of what those things. So, oh, the bu bug bite too is, they're saying that there's actually a bug bite of um, spiders that were in some kind of area and people were starting to claim that they all have these bug bites and nobody really had the bug bites. It was all psychological. But, you know, the same thing happens. We have every once in a while in my house, and I hope this doesn't make anybody itch, but every once in a while we'll have ants that come out, especially when it gets really dry, they'll come looking for water. Yeah. So we, you know, attack the ants, and then once we start talking about it, I just cannot stop itching. Like I have ants crawling on me. And they're not there, but that's, that's just power behind that type of stuff. So that's something else that um, he talks about, how powerful the certain types of suggestions that can be made can actually do things for you. Um, I guess Porter Ranch had that gas leak that was up there that happened. And people, I think people yeah. Psychologically got sick too. Yeah, it was all that way. Yeah. And there were some that actually didn't even get sick to just sue them just to sue them for a lot of money. Oh my goodness. And you know what? They could really actually be experiencing the symptoms, even though they're not really. Uh, yeah. You know. So weird. <laughs> so, anyway, so sign up for the. the um, if you're not on the email list, like I said, as soon as we get confirmation that we have the room, next month we will not be here. We're going to be up, uh, hopefully, up in the that area. By Steamwork Center, in that way. But I'll, I'll send out a notice on that. On that. Does, so, anybody have any other questions before we close out the evening in that way? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's good to see you, Steve. I started, but it was a I'm not even a web guy, I'm a therapist. I'm just kind of coming to learn how to do things, and even with that, I but I, I, but I, I asked the question a couple years ago. I'm just wondering if I finish this. Is there a, like, I have, I have audio, audio, like 20 minute audio um, relaxation, relaxation uh, CD, CD, you know, you know exercises that I could sell, used to sell on cassette tape or CD, but nobody has the use anymore. And, you know, selling them, selling them, thumb drive, thumb drive. It's expensive. It's expensive. I want to, I want to, I want to, on my web. Download or for 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 B. In the last last time I checked in, it was just it was too complicated. No one can get from 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 iTunes. It's like a dollar for you know for downloading. 
So I just wondering if there's any anything other than that for parking. And then do you know how to be local options here? Well I mean maybe now there are but I just don't how long ago was the last time you checked? Like three years ago. Then there were options I, I would say the easiest is just have somebody buy it and just say that you're going to be emailing them the file. It can be still that simple. Well, it's 20 minutes, you said, right? So it's um, one meg for three minutes typically for a 128 bit. So that's only going to be like five. Oh, yeah, ClickBank. Yeah, and they'll accept yeah, your yeah, payment. You don't have to do anything. You just take the payment, and I mean, and they'll take the payment, and they'll just send you a check. I mean, I I still have a couple of um, digital books on on ClickBank, and every once in a while, you know, one. Right. Well, I have a couple of um, exercises that I did this for whatever. 20 years ago, my ex-wife and I had an SAT prep class called Slay the SAT Dragon. And you know, we could do the math and verbal skills, but I would teach them relaxation for it was in the follow-up survey six weeks after the class that they get their grades back. They it was like hands down that relaxation part of the class was the most helpful thing. I mean, access, you know, I mean it helped any relaxing you're taking a test mm -hmm. is really important. So huh. So that's the thing that I, that I might develop next. Is separate. There's a section in this book about test taking that he talks about as well. That I, that falls right into that. There's this guy who's GRE. From, yeah, so he's so I guess he was amongst all these other guys, and this one guy just had the top top one percent of one percent scores of anybody. So they thought, wow, we're gonna have this genius in our group. And they figured out when he was with them, like, he's not smarter than, I mean, he's smart, but he wasn't any smarter than anybody else. So when he got to know him, he asked him what was his secret in getting such high scores on that. And one of the techniques was the, the relaxation before a test and not worrying about stuff he didn't know. And how that just certain things, the techniques that he was using to relieve the stress opened up his ability to take tests way better than that. Cramming is for nothing, then, huh? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, I was going to go over some AdWords techniques if we had time for that, too. Uh, the only thing I can really tell you right now, because we don't have time, is one of the things that I noticed um, that I do at my company, how, which has always been something that people have talked about, but we never implemented it this way, is actually dividing mobile and desktop ads. So you're going to create an ad, and you're going to target um, keywords, and all of those will only be targeting desktop um, devices. And then you do exactly the same type of campaign with the same keywords, but you're only going to be targeting mobile. And the click cost difference is fantastic. And the difference on that plus your ad placements you get better ad placements with that as well so this is a technique that a lot of people I mean it's not it's not a secret it's all over the web that's what you should do it's a best practice in a lot of cases but it is a lot of work to duplicate your your campaigns out so people don't do it um, uh, thankfully I didn't have to create all those campaigns I walked into a company that already had everything set up so I manage it for them uh, as part of a three-man team that were together but looking at how they've done this structuring and the benefit of it, that should be something that I think everybody should be considered uh, when they're doing their, their campaigning. If you have a local business, you definitely should be using location, actually, uh, um, breakouts as well, so that you can target just some campaigns that will target, and then you have your national campaigns that targets everything that's not in your local area that you're targeting if you have a brick and mortar. Those type of things are also very powerful, different bid structures, but you get better costs on that way. And with how, as expensive ads have been getting for Google, Bing, and Yahoo, it's definitely something worth considering. The other thing is that they have systems in place for both Google and Bing that are auto-bidding, that can actually do something. And before, I used to know who's going to trust a computer, especially if it's Google. 
and they don't, you know, it's in their better interest to make as much money as possible off your ads that are coming through. Well, we switched over to the Google auto bidding system versus another very expensive program that used to do the auto bidding for us. And it is phenomenal on how much it optimizes your campaigns. If your campaigns are large enough to do auto bidding, look into doing that and use their system. One, it makes it easier for you. You think you need to have, I think it's like 10 conversions. Um, no, I think it's 100 conversions within a week on that way. No, maybe it is 10 a week. Maybe it wasn't that large. Because it just the only thing is it needs to learn. Now, even if you don't have it as that big of an account to do it, there's also something called CPA bidding, where it'll actually adjust your biddings to get the most cost per acquisition. Now, if you're selling stuff online and you're using bidding to do it, do whatever you can to make sure you can get conversion data onto your, your account, where you call Google, they will help you, but you get a little tracking on it so that it knows how much somebody bought your products for on, and it calculates all that so that it knows how to adjust your bidding on that. I was never a big fan of computer learning uh, processes because I always thought we could do better. You know, how could it adjust for this? How could it adjust for that? But like I said, I've seen this thing start saying tens of thousands per day in advertising for us. So it's a pretty cool thing to take a look at. It's a it's very powerful and um, Google Smart. I mean, to create something like that to get people off other people's platforms in that way. Bing is actually having it in beta, so they're going to have their uh, auto bidding system put out not too long from now. Uh, that's what I think is coming out. If you don't use Google and Bing um, and you have advertising to do, I'd recommend taking a look at it as well. It's still a very very viable. Uh, way to advertise and still, in my opinion, one of the most po uh, powerful ways to get advertising done. What? Okay, other than that, uh, thank you very much. I, I have a great evening, people. Uh, uh, yes, yes, please do.